I steal packages off of porches on Christmas Eve, but I am about to pay the price. Telling me if I didn't get it mowed, they'd start finding me in frustration. I headed over to Josh's house next door to retrieve the mower. As I walked up his cracked cement driveway, I was confused when I realized his grass was nearly as tall as mine. A few patches in the backyard were shorter than the rest, but it didn't look like he had put my mower too much use. I banged on the door. My ears felt hot with frustration, having loaned him the damn mower for it to just sit unused at his house. Yeah, I could hear him shout through the door before he had even opened it. The sliding of chains and the sliding of locks sounded from the other side. If it's a damn salesman, you can go on and, oh, hey, Mikey, how's it going? Not so good, I said flatly. City left me a code violation notice on the door yesterday. Said the grass is too high gonna need to get the mower back before they send me a bill. Josh smiled and tucked his hands behind his head, interlacing his fingers. His eyes drifted down toward the ground, alternating. His feet lifted from the ground and hammered the toe of his tennis shoe against the ground like a fidgeting toddler. Sorry, Mikey, he said, eyes still aimed at the floor, been meaning to talk to ya about that. The mower is busted, kinda hit the blade on a rock, and I think the crankshaft is broken. Been meaning to get a replacement for ya, but money's been tight. You broke my damn mower, I spat. Were you gonna tell me? Look, I said angrily, I bought it at a yard sale for a hundred bucks. Give me fifty, and we will call it even. No can do, Mikey, he said, finally making eye contact with me again. It's like I said, money's been tight. Soon as I got a little extra cash, he'll hit you back. He never repaid me. Wasn't much of a surprise, Josh and I wear it big buddies or anything. Having a pissed off neighbor was a problem for him. He ducked me at every opportunity. Whenever I would knock on the door to try and recover a paltry amount of cash for the mower, he just wouldn't answer. The only time I saw the lousy bastard was when a UPS driver would drop a package on his porch. Probably some damn toy he bought online with the money he said he didn't have, I'd tell myself. It'd serve him right if you took his next package and sold it. Get your money back. That thought festered in my head for a few weeks. Those packages would sit on his porch for hours, just leaning up against the red brick wall of that asshole's house. My eyes would scan the neighborhood for signs of onlookers, but it was always quiet in the middle of the day. No one would see me, and no one did when I finally went through with it. Snatching that first package was a blur. I don't really remember the details. I know I'd watch Josh pull out of the driveway in his rusty coupe about five minutes before the UPS driver leaned the brown box against his door. The next thing I knew, I was sitting at my kitchen table. Brown paper and bubble wrap sat crumpled around an open box. Inside sat a small figure on a rectangle of cardboard. I now know he sold it for double that amount, but there's not much you can do when dealing with a fence. But it's the safest way to make a buck when you're dealing in hot goods. Pawn shops ask too many damn questions. They are the first places that the cops go when something valuable is stolen. You can find a pawn shop or two now and again that does some shady dealings, but most of them are on the up and up. Keep their books clean. Good records of purchases and sales. They may put a hell of a markup on your used junk, but that's as dirty as most of them get. 
eBay is a risky bet, too, and not sure how closely cops keep an eye on it, but it sure would be weird if one account just happened to be. There is a trick to finding which houses to snag the packages from. First, you snatch during daylight. Someone is going to spot you. Second, no apartment buildings or complexes. Same issue, you'll never make it out without someone spotting you. Last, do the best you can to find a house without one of those damn video doorbells. To blend in, I always wear slacks, tennis shoes, a button-up, and a winter vest all brown. Makes you look like a UPS delivery man. No one gives you a second look in that get-up. How many times have you given a UPS driver a double take? Last but not least, I rent a Penske truck from about three cities away. If you're going to spend all night snatching packages, you need something to haul them in. A mid-sized sedan won't cut it. Those box trucks paired with the UPS look-alike outfit help me all but fade into the background of the evening. As soon as the sun goes down, I get to work. The system has run flawlessly for years until earlier tonight. Just after sunset, I jumped into the pink truck and started making my rounds. It had been a decent night, about three dozen packages. My mind was swimming with the possibilities of what waited inside as I continued down the lonely streets. It was nearly ten at night when I decided to wrap things up. Staying out any later than that made it difficult to maintain the illusion you were a delivery man. Slowly, I turned my head over my scheduler and gazed back toward the door. Nothing. The house was pitch black. Doors and windows closed up tightly. I turned and began to head back toward the truck, but couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me in the inky darkness. When I reached the back of the box truck, I raised the rear gate just enough to slide one package in and rolled it back down as quietly as possible. I slipped a smaller package into my pocket, and I worked to secure the door, the lock has just engaged when I heard someone call from the darkness. What have you got there? I booming voice called. Pan it. I spun around and scanned the dark row of houses, but couldn't find the source of the voice. Up here, my eyes drifted up and made contact with a dark silhouette. Its broad, stocky frame lorded over the roof of the house where I had just stolen the package. There was no second-story window. I have crawled out. Panic gave way to confusion. Good evening, I exclaim, the silhouette, just out dropping off some last-minute packages. Took this one to the wrong door earlier, so I had to come back and get it. Merry Christmas. I began to walk toward the door of the truck, when the sound of multiple footsteps on the roof drew my attention again. You must have dropped off a lot of packages at the wrong door, young man, said the voice from atop the house. I've seen you picking up a lot of boxes, but you haven't left any behind. It seems like we're on the same route tonight, an angry, nervous lump bulged in my throat. Knowing someone had watched me throughout the course of the night filled me with equal parts dread and rage. I had managed not to get caught all these years, and the sudden notion that someone had been keeping tabs on me throughout the evening made me feel like an amateur. Look here. Buddy, I said, turning back toward the voice, mind your own damn business. If you're creeping around behind me and haven't called the cops, you can't be up to anything to grate yourself. The dark silhouette on the roof began to bellow in laughter. Butterflies erupted in my guts at the sound. I don't know if it was the unsettling tone or if I were scared. He would wake up the residents of the house, but... Dread filled my body. 
One of us is leaving presents, and one of us is taking them away, the voice said. For shame, Michael, put them back or you'll have to add you to my naughty list. Naughty list. I questioned as I began to crawl into the cab of the truck. Who the hell do you think you are, Sant? The name died on my lips. Michael, the voice said, put the packages back or one of my helpers will have to stay behind and inspire you to do the right thing. Piss off, I shouted as I settled into the seat. You're gonna get the cops called on both of us, you weird piece of. Before I could finish, something fell from the roof and into the bushes in front of the house. As my eyes tried to focus on the thing in the foliage, a massive object lifted away from the dark roof and drifted into the night sky. Panic thundered in my heart when it made eye contact with me, twenty feet away, and standing just outside the bushes, was a squat, stocky thing wearing a crimson robe. It couldn't have been more than three feet tall, but it still looked massive, dangerous. Squealing, crunching metal broke the silence of the night. Just a moment, in the distance, I could hear the low swell of sirens. Give me the the creature rumbled in a heavy, hoarse voice before it the truck of the tree hammered into its sigh. The pale hands loosened from the door frame, and it wailed as it tumbled to the concrete below. I felt something large go beneath the rear tire, Hopefully the creature. The side mirror had been torn off as I grazed the tree, so there was no way to know for certain. Feeling slight relief, I looked down to see that I was driving nearly sixty miles per hour in a residential neighborhood. The sound of sirens was growing closer by the moment. That was before the truck fished ale and tilted onto his left side. My door and window hammered against the ground, sending shards of glass and sparks spraying into the cab. The seat belt cut into my neck, and my body weight pulled me toward the broken window. After what felt like an eternity, the truck screeched to a halt. Slamming and the tearing of metal filled the cab, and I scrambled to unfasten my safety belt. Growing closer, closing the gap, reaching out for me, my anxiety overwhelmed me, causing me to turn my head over my shoulder to see how close the creature was, heart thundering. I scanned the area behind me, my legs slowed, finally stopping and allowing me to turn. It took me nearly two hours on foot, but I finally made it back to my house. The clicking of the locks and latches of the door filled me with comfort. I knew there would be police interviews in the coming days, probably charges and some jail time. It would be a small price to pay for having made it away from that damn thing. I sat in my recliner facing the open window. Street lights flooded the lifeless pavement outside. My eyes were getting heavy, and I snickered to myself thinking of that mutant creature waddling through the dark, putting the stolen packages back on people's porches. That's all the damn thing had wanted, the packages. It had nearly killed me getting them back, but once it had them, it was over. A small shipping package from the last house. I had forgotten that I shoved it in my pocket. It had been so small, it had slipped my mind. It had wanted the packages, all of them, bile rising in my throat. I looked into the street light flooded road. Two red orbs peered back at me through the blinds. Story two. Don't look outside on Christmas Eve. My hands are trembling as I write this. Am hiding in my towel closet. I called the cops, but I don't think they'll be here in time. I mean, who takes calls on Christmas Eve seriously? 
They probably think I'm some teenager prank calling them since I have nothing better to do than take away time from someone's Christmas. Who would believe what I'm about to say anyway? Let me back things up and set the scene for you. I live alone, two states away from my family. I feel terrible for not being able to visit them this year. I've been having financial struggles as of recent. Paying off student loans is no joke. This is the first time I've been able to live on my own. I'm renting a cabin in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, Wisconsin. All that's around is a convenience store and a bar. The place is nice and the rent is cheap. So who am I to complain? One bed, one bath, and a cramped kitchen. That's right behind the living room. The living room has a nice fireplace too. It keeps the house warm through the night. So now that you've got the picture, I need to share my experience. No matter how few people see it, I don't have big plans for the holidays. Stay at home, watch some TV, and eat a frozen pizza if I was lucky. No big fancy dinner, no visitors, just an average night. That's just what happened. I kicked back on the couch with pizza in hand, and watched Christmas movies until my eyes grew heavy. I was awakened by a knock at my door at around eleven forty-five. It's dark and snowy out, per usual this time of year. I don't get visitors, nor could I see who it was. So I looked out of the small window in the living room. Frost cloaked. The glass, making it a challenge to see who was waiting for my answer. I could make out a human-like figure. My gut was telling me to stay the hell away from what was at my door before I even got a chance to move. The snow was falling so heavily that it was hard to see anything beyond six feet of my house. I trusted my gut though, and moved to my room. I began to think I was a bad person for leaving whoever was out there in the icy mess. Just as the thought entered my mind, the knocking grew louder. I covered my ears in response to the noise beyond my door. I faced away, and it only got worse. Bang, bang, bang! I was right to trust my gut. Bang, bang, bang! I shouldn't open the door. Bang, bang, bang! I can't let this go on. I exhaled deeply and threw my legs over the bed and reluctantly shuffled over to my door. I twisted the knob and peeked outside. The cold weather nipped at my face as a reply. Hello! I peered through the crack. Hi! The person started. I began to make out facial characteristics and realized it was a young woman. My car broke down, and this seemed like a good place to seek shelter. That was a red flag to me. There's a convenience store and a bar within a mile of each other. Why show up to a random house for help? Now I consider myself a nice guy, but the holidays don't make me a giving person. I don't like my sleep being interrupted either. Oh, um, I started. I wasn't sure how to respond. Her behavior was off, to say the least. She was glancing over her shoulder as if she could see anything through the darkness and snow. I can give you a number for a towing company. There should be an inn at least a few miles from here. The towing company can take you. She didn't seem satisfied. Are you sure? She inquired. It's awfully cold out here, and I don't know how long it will take them to get here. She began to look more paranoid. Her eyes darted from side to side, up and down. It was really freaking me out. Listen, Han. My house is a wreck, and it's the middle of the night. I'm sorry. I know it's the holidays, but I have a thing about letting strangers into my house. I immediately regretted saying those words. Her fear turned to anger. At this point, she became hysterical. 
She kicked, punched, and beat my door, trying to force herself in. Her polite words were now screams, let me in, let me in. The Jane Doe at my door pounded harder and harder. It seemed like my door was about to break. What the hell are you supposed to do in this situation? So, in the spur of the moment, I just locked the door. The knob rattled violently and stopped abruptly. I picked up my phone and alerted authorities that there was a manic woman outside of my house. At this point, I figured she had given up and left. I sat down in front of the TV and tried to enjoy the rest of the night. I pondered why she was so upset. No family, trauma, none of my theories added up. Just as my thinking had concluded and I began to relax, I heard a faint sound, a sound that was so quiet but seemed so loud. It was the shuffling of snow outside of my window. I pulled my blinds back and peeked outside. The dim light from the street lamps shone onto my white lawn. The woman was making a circle in the snow. I squinted, trying not to reveal my presence. My eyes began to adjust to the darkness outside. It was now one o'clock a.m. There were symbols I couldn't recognize and a large pentagram in the center. When she finished her artwork, she looked right at me. She was staring into my soul. Her gaze sent chills down my spine. Her mouth opened at inhuman angles. Just then, a scream was released. I fell back into the couch. What the fuck do I do? I called the cops for a second time. Writing this, they'll be censoring my address for my own security. Here's how that phone call went. Address, I need police, please. Come quick. Sir, we already have the sheriff and backup on their way. They should be there within the hour. Lock your doors. I heard a click on the other end. Well, what am I supposed to do now? Am alone in this house, which seems much more ominous than the night before. There's some psycho lady standing in my yard in the middle of the night. To top it off, the cops that should be arresting this woman are probably out for drinks. I let out an audible sigh and sat on the floor with my back to the couch. This was not what I thought of as an ideal Christmas. I figured I might as well freshen up and get ready for bed. Any sliver of hope left in me was gone. I picked myself up off the floor and made my way to the bathroom. I didn't want to risk her seeing me, so I just used the dim flashlight on my phone. I brushed my teeth and rinsed my face. I thought that would make me feel better, more alert. I was wrong. Once I had finished, I heard a knock at the door, followed by a scream. It was deep, and like the shrieks previously heard from the girl, something in me clicked. I mustered the strength to peek outside. There were blue and red lights flashing, signaling help had arrived, but something was wrong. The lights from the car further illuminated my lawn. There were two mangled bodies left inside of what I can only describe as the altar. Remnants of black uniforms informed me of who they were, police. Another guttural howl was heard, this time only a few feet away from my window. I did the only thing I could think of, and that was to hide. That brings me to the now him in my towel closet. There are two dead bodies in the snow and something outside of my house. Something not human. I don't know when she or it, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, will get inside, but my gut is saying that she will. I couldn't have picked a worse spot to hide. I feel like the idiot friend in a horror movie that gets plucked off first. Please, if you're reading this, protect yourself this holiday season. Don't let it know you're there, don't he like me. Please, 
Save yourself and your family. I just heard something come down the chimney. And it's not Santa. She's inside. Story 3 Every Christmas Eve, a monster challenges me to a game. Growing up, I don't think we had a single moment free of struggle. We were a poor family that couldn't make ends meet most months. Living basically day to day, as we tried our best to stretch my father's income until the next paycheck came in. My father, God bless his soul, raised me by himself, and he was a hard-working man throughout his life. Mom died giving birth to me, her first and only child, and my father refused to remarry and make things easier for him. I only ever loved one woman. He told me, when we talked about it once I reached adulthood, that's not something you can replace. I'll take those feelings with me to the grave. Being the sole breadwinner in the house was a toll order to have to step up to. He was barely ever home, away for various jobs even during the weekends. In a sense, I sort of raised myself now that I think about it, but his absence never made me despise my father or grow distant towards him. Quite the opposite, in fact. It made the few precious moments we got to share mean even more to me. Some of those moments were during holidays like Easter or Christmas, when he didn't work. We lived out in the boonies in a small house that he inherited when Grandpa passed away, a cramped but comfortable place that was just the right size for the two of us. It was also close to the wilderness, so my father would go out hunting for meat every once in a while. Don't question me on his methods or the legality of his actions, I can't answer either. Truth is, I never knew or cared. All that mattered was that he filled the fridge and kept me fed without having to spend a dime from our already limited budget. I grew up mostly on venison, and wild rabbit, pork, and especially beef were a rarity. He tried to teach me from a young age to impart his knowledge onto me, but I was an eager learner. I had no problem with eating cute forest critters. I just couldn't hunt them and kill them myself. But my father still tried, taking me out on a few hunting trips with him and our old dog. Charles, my father's companion into the wilderness, was a pure breed, of course, just an old mutt that my father rescued from a shelter. But he was big and had a keen sense of smell despite his age, so he was a huge help in tracking down prey. The few times I saw him in action, I was impressed. One such instance comes to mind right away. The three of us, Charles, my father, and I, were out looking for a deer on a chilly autumn day. We found tracks and followed them until we spotted the deer, but my father missed the shot and scared it away. Charles ran after it when the deer bolted, and we ran after the dog to not lose him. He led us on a wild chase through the forest for a few minutes, but we finally caught up to him on the banks of a river that crisscrossed the trees. What's he doing? I asked my father when we saw Charles pacing back and forth on the edge of the whirling waters. The deer probably jumped in and got swept by the current, my father answered. The water washed away the set trail, so Charles is confused. We followed the river downstream, and, true enough, we found the deer's carcass. Charles strutted over to it victoriously, giving us a good laugh. We had venison steak for dinner that night, and my father made sure to give Charles a big, juicy cut for his troubles. Anyways, my story takes place in that home when I was about eight years old. Despite our shaky financial situation, my father always tried to make the holiday seasons special for me. He could never afford fancy gifts 
like Game Boys, for example, when those were hot, but his gestures never went unappreciated. We mostly painted eggs together for Easter or went out hiking before Christmas to find nice trees we could fell and bring home to decorate. But that particular Christmas hadn't gone down as planned a few months beforehand. Dad fell ill, and his condition worsened until he was left bedridden. He didn't want to go see a doctor right away, saying that he only needed to rest, but he eventually relented. After a round of tests, the doctors told him the one thing that nobody wants to hear. He had pancreatic cancer, and it already started spreading to other organs. All cancers are nasty ugly affairs, but the pancreatic kind is especially vile. It gives nearly no symptoms until it is too late to do something about it. And that was the case for my father. Even with treatment, the doctors said that his chances for survival were slim at best, but my father refused treatment. So they predicted his death to happen some time around New Year's. The news devastated him though he shielded me from them to the best of his ability. I only found out about it later, when I was older. As it stood, I only knew that he was sick. Being a young kid that thought of his father as a permanent part of their life, the thought that he might die never even occurred to me. But he deteriorated visibly each day, until a neighbor had to come over every so often to help him out with the most basic tasks. Why not someone from our family, you might ask, simple. We had few living relatives, and the ones he did have were deadbeats, never giving a crap about us except when they needed to borrow money. They wouldn't have helped take care of a sick man, and they definitely wouldn't have taken me in after my father's passing. Listen, Nico, Dad told me one December evening after calling me into his bedroom. He'll be very sick for a while. I might never get better. His voice was weak and raspy, and I could tell that he had difficulty getting those few words out. You will, I protested. Maybe. He relented, but until that happens, you'll need to go and live with someone else that can take care of you. I don't want to, I said, stomping my foot down. I know, he admitted a few tears forming around his eyes, but you have to do it. For me, okay, I almost cried myself, though it was more out of frustration than anything else. I didn't understand the severity of our predicament back then. Turning around, I found the neighbor in the doorway with tears in her eyes as well. She was an older lady living all by herself some fifteen minutes away, the closest person to us out here. Her name was Daisy, and she had always been kind to me, giving me homemade sweets and pocket money and ever me and Dad went over to help her out with small chores. She had been the closest thing I had to a grandma growing up. Miss Daisy made some arrangements, Dad said after a short pause. Some nice people will come by after Christmas, and you'll have to go with them. Okay, I didn't stay around to listen anymore. I ran out of the room, bawling my eyes out. Daisy yelled after me, trying to stop me, but I couldn't, I didn't want to live with someone else, I wanted to stay with my dad, after I got outside, I made my way to my usual spot where I played most days, a dingy little tree house that dad built for me a couple of summers back, but I loved the place to death, I climbed up into it to hide having no plans to actually run away from home. I simply wanted to be alone for a while, in a place where Daisy couldn't reach me to drag me back inside. I heard her calling for me for quite some time, but she eventually relented and went home for the night. 
but I spent the night wide awake up in the treehouse, looking over the forest as I tried to think of a way to solve our problems. I didn't have any money, and, with Christmas right around the corner, and me being a child, I couldn't earn it fast enough either. So any ideas involving doctors or payment in general were out first. I wasn't particularly religious either, so prayer never even crossed my mind. Santa, I decided after every other solution went nowhere. He always brought me what I wanted. I'll ask him to make Dad better as my Christmas present. Not a bad plan, so long as you believed in Santa, of course, which at that young age I still did. In my mind it was foolproof, a 100% guaranteed chance of success. I'd been a good boy all year. I help out and never misbehaved, so Santa would have to give me the present I wanted. After that plan was hatched, I went back inside and went to bed. No point in ruining my good boy streak. The next day I woke up first thing in the morning, got my dad's hand saw, and ventured out into the woods all by my lonesome. With him being bedridden we ain't gone hunting for a Christmas tree that year, but we needed one for Santa. Didn't we? That we did, and I decided to take the matter into my own hands. I spent all morning and a good chunk of the afternoon searching until I found a fur that I considered good enough. Don't ask me the exact species. I have no idea. Back then they were all Christmas trees to me. Anyway, I got it down all by myself, which proved to be a much more difficult task than I had expected. I got Tangled in the branches as I tried to reach its trunk, I received plenty of scratches, nearly poked out one of my eyes at some point, but I succeeded, and I dragged it back home victoriously. Where were you? Daisy scolded when I entered the house. She had returned while I was away, and she was ready to give me an earful for my outburst. Your father was worried sick for you. I let her scold me to her heart's content, apologized, and brought the tree inside. Dad was impressed with me, and he all but dragged himself out of bed to help me set up the tree. I realized in the meantime that he hoped to spend one final Christmas with me, to give me some heartwarming memories to hold on to when he'd be gone, but at that moment I didn't consider it. I simply had fun carrying out our usual Christmas routine. We didn't have much to hang on the branches, no fancy lights and candles and what not, just the same old tinsel and baubles that we reused ever since I could remember. But the tree still turned out stunning, and it was made even better for me by the fact that I went out and got it myself. I behaved after that waiting for the days to pass one by one. Dad got visibly worse with each one, to the point where he needed to be spoon-fed and couldn't get up to use the bathroom. But I still held out hope, convinced that once Christmas came, Santa would give me my present. It felt like years waiting for the 24th to arrive, but it swung around eventually. I stayed up waiting, knowing full well that I wasn't supposed to do that. After all, Santa skipped houses if the kids inside didn't sleep, but I wanted to meet him and ask him my wish face to face to make sure that it would come true. Evening came and passed, night settled outside, and I pretended to go to sleep after we ate dinner and Daisy left. As soon as I was sure that Dad was asleep, I got up and made my way to the living room on my toes. With no place to really hide in the small room, I got behind the Christmas tree and waited. My hope was that the darkness would hide me for long enough until Santa came in. The only clock in the house was on the opposite wall in full view, 
but barely visible. I watched the seconds ticking away into minutes, seeing 10 p.m. turn to 11. It was quite the ordeal to stand and wait for that long, but I was determined. I nearly fell asleep at one point, but 11.59 rolled around, and that sobered me up real good. I held my breath as I watched the sweep hand go on until it reached the last second before midnight. Then it got stuck, refusing to transition into midnight. Did the battery run out, I wondered. At any rate, I thought no big deal of it. Just because the clock stopped didn't mean that midnight wouldn't come. I waited for a few seconds for Santa to come down the admittedly small chimney. But as the seconds turned into a minute, I started to worry. Did he figure me out? Did I undo all my goodness with this one stunt? Did he skip our house? I got out from behind the tree, walking out in the open. As my worry turned to panic, I would blown it. No, I whispered with desperation. No, no. No, 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 please. I'm sorry, plea. The words got stuck in my throat when I heard something from outside. The sound of skittering feet approaching the house from the surrounding woods, tapping on the walls as something climbed to the roof. Santa came after all, and I waited for him with bated breath. The sounds of his rushing feet reached the roof, then they stopped. I looked at the chimney intently, backing away slowly to give him room. Something scraped against the bricks and mortar, giving off a bristly sound, and before long I saw a face emerge from the fireplace. Two beady black eyes came into view first, scanning the room from side to side and settling on me. The rest of his head followed, looking like silly putty being forced through a tube. My wonder turned to terror as he advanced little by little, revealing a thin, centipede-like body with many small legs. After it was done, and he was fully in the room with me, he stared at me for what felt like hours. His mouth contorted into a twisted grin, the corners of his lips cracking and spreading until they reached his ears, hundreds of tiny, Needle-sharp teeth peered at me from inside his maw, yellowed and blasted with decay. What are you doing up so late, child? Question. Bringing me out of my stupefaction. You should be sleeping. I, I'm waiting for, for Santa, I stuttered an answer. Are, are you him? You shouldn't be waiting for Santa, he answered. That makes you a naughty boy. I'm sorry, I mumbled, on the verge of tearing up, but I, I wanted, let me guess, he said in a bored tone, you wanted to ask for a specific gift, what would it be, a new bicycle, toes, make daddy feel better, he's sick, I said with conviction, that's the only present I want, he raised an eyebrow hearing that, and scurried closer to me, his long body called, surrounding me as his beady eyes examined me. The color in my face drained, and it took all I had to keep from screaming and running away. Very well, he answered. Let us see your father. I might be able to offer you what you wish for. He pulled away, allowing me to lead him to Dad's bedroom. I did so, opening the door slowly to reveal the dark room. Dad was in his bed sleeping, so Santa followed me inside. He pushed himself up, holding his spindly body above Dad with only a couple of hind legs. He does look sick, he admitted. One of his front limbs reached down, touching Dad's forehead. Very sick, but I can help. Then do it. Please, I whispered. I will, but only if you play a game with me, he answered. If you beat me at it, I'll cure your father, and... And if I lose, I asked, scared by the prospect. 
That's a surprise you'll have to find out, he answered and gave me another grin that set chills down my spine. I wanted to refuse, but seeing Dad in that state broke my heart. He'd done so much for me over the years that I couldn't let him down now when he needed me. What's the game? I asked. You've been a good little boy all year, so I'll let you choose, he said. I thought it over for a bit, trying to decide what game I was best at. I didn't know a lot of them, so my options were limited, but I eventually settled on one. Hide and seek, I answered. His grin grew a bit wider hearing that. Okay, he said with satisfaction. I'll do the seeking, you'll do the hiding. If I can't find you for ten minutes, you win. Is that good? Yes, I answered, already thinking of potential hiding spots. Great, I'll count to one hundred, so scurry off and hide. He turned to face the wall and started counting out loud, so I bolted out of the room and left the house entirely. As tempting as it was to hide and sigh, I figure it would be the first place he'd look for me. My best chance was to get as far away as possible before he started searching. The moment I got outside, I was taken aback by what I found. It was snowing pretty heavily only minutes prior, but now the bulky flakes were suspended in midair. There was no wind, no sound, no movement whatsoever, like the world itself paused for our game. It looked and felt surreal. Hearing the creature counting loudly and sigh, I blocked all of it out and continued running. I counted down from one hundred in my head as I went, and I got pretty far away from home in that time. I hoped to make it to the tree house, but it was too far away, so I dove into some bushes instead. Without anything on me to tell time, I had to approximate as I waited for the ten minutes to pass. I think it was two minutes, and by the time he left the house as well, I could see his monstrous figure leaving through the front door in the moon's pale light, but something was different. He moved faster, more erratically, his head turning from side to side in search of me. I thought he didn't know about the treehouse, but I was wrong. He scurried past the bushes I was hiding in, going right for it. I caught a glimpse of his face when he passed by, and his expression petrified me. He looked scary before, but now he looked downright terrifying, the grin on his lips more evil than I thought possible. He really wanted to catch me. I saw him reaching the treehouse, climbing up with little effort. He pushed his body inside through the window, breaking some of the planks apart in the process. When he didn't find me up there, he let out an angry screech and started tearing the treehouse to shreds. I saw pieces of it flying as he thrashed about inside, until all that was left was a devastated husk. When he was done, he climbed down and looked at the forest for a few tense moments. I started realizing just how dire my situation was, so I retreated further into the darkness. But before I did, I saw his face contorting as something bubble to the surface of his skin between his eyes. A deformed snout formed out of his flesh, and he started sniffing the air with it. I didn't wait to see if he'd find me, knowing full well that he would. Instead, I got out of the bushes on the other side and ran away deeper into the forest. I estimated that maybe five minutes had passed, so I had five more to go. The sounds of his feet rushing after me came from behind, so I forced myself to run even faster. With hiding out of the question, I had to find a way to escape him for long enough. The way Charles tracked down prey using his sense of smell came to mind, so I knew I needed to erase my scent somehow. The river, I decided, 
remembering how that deer managed to escape Charles and his nose, I ran into its general direction, deeper and deeper into the woods, and I eventually came across it. Luckily for me, it wasn't entirely frozen over. I stepped out on the treacherous ice until I felt it cracking beneath my feet, so I shot a soul at it and broke it. I fell into the freezing water, feeling it pushing all the air out of my lungs as it seeped into my clothes and invaded my skin. It was frigid, and thermal shock or hypothermia were very real dangers, but they didn't worry me much at that moment. In fact, they barely crossed my mind. My only goal was to escape the horrific creature that was after me. The current pushed me under the ice and carried me along on its underside, scraping me against the jagged edges that had formed. I got scratched and bruised. Sensation left the tips of my fingers and feet as the cold worked its way into my flesh and my lungs burned for air. The ordeal didn't last for long, but it was excruciating. Half a minute later at most, the current spat me out of another break in the ice. I clung to it, trying in vain to drag myself out as I panted heavily, prying my eyes open. I could barely make out the spot upstream where I jumped in. The creature reached it and paused, sniffing the air as puffs of steam left his nostrils. He looked around in confusion, so I ducked back down into the waters. Despite the heavy price I paid, my plan worked. Coming back up to the surface, I saw him crossing the river and continuing deeper into the woods. As the few minutes left of our game passed, I just waited, holding on for dear life, where he finally overtook me as the dire nature of my situation set in. I would win but I would freeze to death in the process as I didn't have the strength to pull myself out of the river. And even if I did get out, I'd die on my way home to exposure. Wet to the bone as I was, and with the temperature outside well into the negatives, the air itself would do me in. I was starting to slip away into unconsciousness when I noticed the snowflakes began to fall to the ground again. That was a clear signal that the game was over. So I started screaming, Help! Please! Help me! My voice, although weak, carried far and wide through the night. I kept calling out, and soon enough I heard the creature barreling towards me through the forest. He emerged from between the trees with a wide frown on his face that turned to a grin when he saw me. You're quite resourceful, Nicholas, he said as he approached the river. I must commend you for that and for defeating me. He stepped on the ice, and I expected his huge body to break it easily, but it didn't. The ice didn't as much as crack under his enormous weight. One of his appendages came up, and he pointed at my way for me to grab it. I did, and he effortlessly lifted me out of the water. Now hold on tight. We have to get you to shelter right away, he said as he put me on his back. I got my arms around his throat, and he galloped through the forest with the same amazing speed he had displayed before. If not for the circumstances I was in, I might have enjoyed the bumpy, fast-paced ride. In no time at all, we were back home, and I went inside to change and warm up. You'll get a nasty cold tomorrow, but you will live, he told me, and your father will as well. You won, so I will see to my end of our agreement. He went to Dad's room with me in toll and he placed his creepy feet along Dad's sleeping form. Color gradually returned to Dad's skin, and he drew in a deep inhale, but he didn't wake up. There, I have upheld my promise, he said, and turned to leave the room. 
See you next year, Nicholas, and remember to be a good boy. He then left through the chimney, and I heard him scurrying off back into the forest. True to his word, my father woke up the next morning in perfect health. To everyone's utter shock except my own, I ask Santa to make you better as my gift. I explain to him and Daisy. I tried to tell them more, to go into detail, but I couldn't, and I don't mean that in a corny. Oh, I didn't want them to worry way. I literally couldn't. The words wouldn't travel up my throat, no matter how hard I tried to push them out. My father nodded, and a few tears escaped his eyes. Tears of happiness, I thought at the time, but now I'm having doubts. That Christmas was the happiest one in my life, and getting to spend it with my father made me forget my ordeal. Later checkups with the doctors reveal that any trace of cancer was gone from his body, like it was never even there. They questioned him, of course, but that got them nowhere, so they called it a miraculous recovery and left it at that. But my story doesn't end there, unfortunately, for the creature kept its other promise as well, returning year after year on Christmas Eve for us to play again, just as the first time it allowed me to choose, and I chose every game under the sun over the years. I de research and practiced them the whole year beforehand, and I never picked games based on luck, just ones based on skill. That allowed me to remain one step ahead and win each and every time. Much to the creature's surprise, my father lived a long and healthy life, but he died in the summer of 2020 at 72. I myself am 43 years old going on 44, and we maintained a close relationship throughout the years. His death was devastating to me, but I found solace in the fact that I delayed it all of those decades ago. But then something else happened, and on the Christmas Eve of 2020, I finally lost my first game with the creature. He grinned widely like he'd done back when he chased me, and I prepared myself to be dragged off to some horrible fate. Instead, he left without saying a word. I don't know if he'll return again this Christmas, but truth be told I might not live to see the 24th. A couple of months ago, I fell ill just like my dad had. I made appointments and got checked out and my worst fear was realized. I was diagnosed with the same cancer that the creature got rid of in my father. Ever since, I spent my time in and out of chemotherapy as I slowly deteriorated. Even though money is no longer a problem and medical knowledge has advanced so far, I'm still beyond saving. I'm lying on my deathbed now as I write this out counting the moments, unsure how many of them I have left, but am not scared for myself, no. You see, I have a loving wife by my side and two young kids of my own, two brothers of seven and nine years old, respectively, two amazing yet naive kids that I love like nothing else in this world and who are as pained to see me in this condition as I was to see my father. So yes, a creature might return this Christmas to play once more, but I worry that this time I won't be one of the players. I've tried talking to my wife and sons about it, but it's just like all of those years ago. The words about the creature won't come out of me. My only hope now that I'll be six feet under come the 24th of December, so that my sins won't be passed down to my sons like they've been passed down to me by my father. I'd gladly take death over waking up healthy on Christmas morning. Story 4. Every Christmas Eve, we throw a holiday party. No one is allowed to leave for 48 hours, one hour till midnight. 
John shouted as he ran through the living room. I glanced towards the small closet in the hallway. The door had been removed and propped up against the opposite wall, as usual, and the mistletoe had been hung up in the center of the doorway. The closet was empty, and there was no light coming from inside. I held on to my glass of water, nervous. I never drank at the annual holiday party. The things we were about to see were bad enough sober and I couldn't even imagine what it would be like if I were drunk. I looked over at Mel, who was smoking a joint as she did every year, and not sure how she managed to get through the events of the night, but maybe being high helped her to process what she saw. John ran back through the living room, stopping to make sure all the windows were locked and all the curtains were shut. He walked over to the front door, rattling the doorknob and pulling on the door to make sure that it too was locked before making his way into the kitchen. The rest of us, Ben, Alma, Mel, and I sat around the living room in silence. Even though we had done this every year for the last three years, it was something you could easily get used to. The horrors that we would witness tonight wouldn't be anything like the horrors from last year or the year before. We took over this ritual from our parents, who had passed it on to us when we turned eighteen. Ever since then, we have made sure that every year on Christmas Eve, we gather at John's house to make sure that we keep all the holiday horrors away from the rest of you. The drugs and the food are only here to distract us. Although it hardly ever works, we all gather on the day before Christmas Eve, a few minutes before midnight, and we stay inside John's house until midnight on Christmas night. It doesn't always start at the same time, but never before 1 p.m. on Christmas Eve. So we always make sure that we are inside the house and that all the exits are locked tight before the fun starts. I use the word fun very loosely here. I set my glass of water down as Mel passed by me, letting us know she was going to pee before it all started. She came back fairly quickly and plopped back down on the couch, sighing. Mel was always annoyed that we had to do this. She didn't seem as affected by it as the rest of us, and would usually spend most of the month of December complaining about the holiday party. John Ben shouted suddenly, It's starting. I looked back at the closet. Ben was right. It was starting, and standing in the threshold under the mistletoe was a creature whose top half was a reindeer with the bottom half of a nude human male. It stood there, looking towards us. Its head had a big hole where its left eye should have been, as if it had been shot there, and there was dried blood all over its face. Its left antler was broken in half, and I could see some bugs crawling around the wand in its face. What the fuck is that? Alma whispered. No one reply. We just stood there, watching it as it watched us. It retreated back into the closet before it got down on all fours and charged towards us. I still flinch, even though I knew it couldn't make it more than a few feet away from the closet. I remember asking my parents once why we had to make sure all the exits were locked. Even though most of the monsters couldn't get more than a few feet away from the mistletoe, they didn't give me a direct answer, only that making sure that everything was locked guarantee that nothing would get out. Jesus fucking Christ, Mel shouted. I continued to charge towards us, ramming into the invisible berries each time. Then, just as it had randomly appeared, the creature randomly disappeared, and there was a few minutes of empty silence. No one said a word, but we all watched as the next creature appeared. This one was human, but there was something wrong with him, as usual. 
The man had been flattened out to resemble the shape of a gingerbread man. He had large, rotting gum drops that were meant to be gingerbread buttons sewed down his front. His mouth had been pulled back at the corners with some sort of metal hoops that pierced through his skin in order to give him a permanent smile. He waddled from side to side as he attempted to balance on his flattened feet. As he tried to walk out of the closet, his arms got stuck in the doorway and he ran into it over and over, slamming himself into it harder and harder each time until there was a sickening crunching noise and his arms flopped backwards. He finally waddled through the doorway and this time he made it out further than the first creature had and began waddling towards us. Fuck this, Ben said, leaping behind the couch to take cover. I took a few steps back as the man continued to waddle towards the living room. Suddenly a branch pierced through his chest from the back and he was violently pulled back into the closet where he disappeared. That was immediately followed by dozens of branches that snaked their way around the floor of the house, climbing up the walls as they made their way round the house. The branches were covered in the sharpest pine needles I had ever seen with a few random, broken ornaments hanging off of them. I jumped up onto a couch as the branches made their way into the living room, and everyone else followed my lead as we watched the branches weave in and out of the floorboards. Suddenly, Alma screamed, and I turned towards her. Some of the branches had wrapped around the legs of the chair she was on, and she was being pulled towards the closet. Chun attempted to reach out for her as she was dragged past him, but the branches began to snake up and intertwine until they created a sort of protective dome around the chair, trapping Halma inside. She continued to yell as I tried to figure out a way to get to her without the branches getting to me, but it seemed impossible. It was like the branches had a mind of their own and were making sure that none of us could help Alma. We watched as she was dragged into the closet along with the chairs before the branches finally retreated. What was that they've never taken any of us before, Ben said. No one replied as we continued to watch the closet. Suddenly, Alma leaped out and ran out, but was stopped a few feet away from the doorway. What? She shouted, panicked, let me out. John leapt off the coffee table and ran over, grabbing hold of Alma's hand and attempting to pull her away from the doorway, but he c-o-u-l-d-n-t dot 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 leave me here, please help me. Alma sobbed. Ben ran over and tried to help John, but something was holding Alma back and stopping them from pulling her away. Ow. Alma shouted suddenly. I ran over as Mel followed. What happened? I asked. I don't know. Did we pull too hard? John asked Alma. Ow. Alma shouted again, louder this time. Alma, what's wrong? I asked. It hurts. She shouted as she fell to her knees. We watched as she continued to shout in pain, and then we realized what was happening. Her skin was being peeled off in one large chunk. Her biceps had been exposed as the skin continued to peel from the back to the front until everything, including her face, came off. Alma continued to scream the whole time, even after her skin was off, her skin began crawling towards us as she screamed and cried in the background, and it started to make sense why John's parents had told him to find a remote area to host the parties at. We began to back away as her skin continued to crawl towards us. I soon realized that it was heading towards John specifically and he backed into a wall as it continued to snake towards him. 
climbing up his body. It was at this point that I realized that Alma had stopped screaming, and I turned just in time to see her limp body being dragged back into the closet. It looked like she was dead. I started to get anxious then. None of the things we witnessed had ever affected us this much. Usually some of us would walk away with some scratches, but nothing this permanent. I took a deep breath as I tried to ignore the voice in the brain that was screaming at me to get out of the house as soon as possible. But I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't let all of these things out into the world. I turned back to look at John as Alma's skin began wrapping itself around his torso until it tightened and formed a weird skin sweater around him. John started to gag and I looked away as I felt the urge to vomit. John began freaking out and I looked back to see him attempting to peel the skin sweater off his body. Every time he pulled part of it off, it began to bleed until his hands and legs were covered in blood. He started to cry, scratching at Alma's skin as he tried desperately to peel it off. It did come off eventually, and John kicked it aside as he ran into the kitchen. I heard the faucet open as he continued crying. Oh, God. I turned at the sound of Ben's voice to see small elves walking out of the closet. They were dressed in typical green outfits, but they were severely deformed, with different sized heads, arms, and legs. We watched as they all headed towards the pile of Alma's skin. They began to pick it up as she tore off pieces of it with their teeth and ate it until it was all gone. Then they got on the floor and licked up all the blood before returning back into the closet. There's only five minutes left until midnight, Ben said, breaking the silence. Do you think it's over then? I asked. No, Mel replied. I looked over to see that she was pointing at the closet. I could hear footsteps coming from inside. Do you feel that? John asked. I turned, not noticing that he had come back from the kitchen. We stood still as I began to notice that the house was getting cold. It continued to drop in temperature until my teeth were chattering. The footsteps continued, even though nothing appeared. I rubbed my arms as I tried to warm up and began to notice a thin layer of ice appearing on every item in the house. For the next few minutes, the house continued to grow colder and colder until I was sure that we were going to die. I could feel my heartbeat slow down as my fingers turned blue. My eyes had started to burn from the cold and I could no longer move. Then, just when I thought it was all over, it was gone and the house warmed up in the blink of an eye. Is it over? I asked. He yeah. asked. It's midnight, Ben reply. Where's Alma? John asked. I carefully walked over to the closer, peering inside. It was empty. There was no sign of Alma anywhere. What the fuck happened? I asked. I don't know, John reply. This has never happened before, Ben said. She's dead. There's nothing we can do about it, Mel replied curtly. She began to gather her stuff, and we watched as she threw open the front door and left, slamming the door shut behind her. What do we tell her parents? John asked. I don't know, I shrugged. I should get going too, Ben said suddenly. I could tell that he was about to cry, and I stepped out of his way as he left the house. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes and I excused myself as I ran upstairs and shut the bathroom door behind me. I splashed cold water on my face as I tried to make sense of what had happened. I wondered why this time had been different. As I racked my brain for reasons, I felt a sudden chill as I noticed it was abnormally cold in the bathroom. I turned around as I heard a car start. 
and stood there staring at the open bathroom window. My heart began to hammer against my chest as my thoughts ran a million miles a minute. I walked over to the window and glanced down just in time to see Alma's car backing out of the driveway. Confused, I stuck my head out the window and squinted as I tried to make out the driver. As the car turned out into the street, I got a direct view into the driver's seat, where I saw a scan, blistering red Alma drive off down the road. Story 5 My grandmother always used to tell stories on Christmas Eve. I recall one of them that was extremely bizarre. One of my favorite parts of Christmas Eve when I was a kid was story time. I grew up in a big family, and every year my parents would have the whole gang over. All of my aunts and uncles from both sides of the family, my eight cousins, and my grandparents. Of course, being kids, my cousins and I all thirsted after the gifts that we would see pile up under the Christmas tree, like falling snow. But after we had unwrapped our new toys and were completely numb from how much food we had eaten, we would gather round at our grandmother's feet and she would tell us stories. Grandma was a great storyteller. She always had this twinkle in her eye as she leaned in close and whispered to us once. Upon a time the whole room would fall silent when Grandma spoke. Even the adults in the room would turn their heads to listen to whatever concoction her brain had come up with that year. The multicolored lights from the Christmas tree would twinkle behind her head to match that glimmer in her eye. My grandmother died earlier this year. It's going to be our first Christmas without story time. Even as my cousins and I aged into our teenage years, our parents into their fifties, and our grandparents into their eighties, my grandmother never stopped telling her stories. Christmas this year is going to be the same. Recently, I've been reminiscing about Grandma's story time, trying to remember her greatest hits. I've been wanting to remember them as accurately as possible, so that maybe I can make note of what I remember and go from there, so that I can keep the Christmas storytelling tradition going when my cousins and I have children of our own. I've remembered about seven of Grandma's stories so far. But the reason I'm writing on Now Sleep today is because I've remembered another one that she told when I was about ten years old. This story is a peculiar one, the only bizarre one that Grandma ever told us, and I want to share it with you guys. I don't remember exactly what the title of the story was, but it goes something like this. In my own words, what is a child's favorite part of Christmas? The presents, obviously, and after mommy and daddy. Who do children immediately think of when they think of presents under the tree? Santa Claus, of course. The big man in the bright red suit, jolly laugh, and herd of reindeer to pull him through the snowy night sky as he delivers presents to every good kid around the world. There is not a single child that I know who doesn't get excited when they think about Santa Claus. Good kids get presents and naughty kids get coal. At least every kid gets something. But Santa's challenge is just about getting around the whole world in one night and delivering presents. No, he is more to worry about than that. You see, children... Santa doesn't visit every house, but every house gets a visit on Christmas Eve. Not many people know this, but there is another Santa, except, of course, he is Santa. Physically, they look more or less the same, except the other Santa doesn't wear a bright red suit. He looks different to every child. He doesn't have a jolly laugh. He just stares. He doesn't drink milk and eat cookies. 
In fact, he doesn't eat anything. He doesn't have a sled pulled by reindeer, and he doesn't come down the chimney. No, he gets in through the back door or from the basement, and he knows where all the children's rooms are. He never delivers presents, but he does punish the naughty children. How bad the punishment is depends on how bad you've been that year. He can make children very sick. Some children visited by him have had the stomach flu that lasted to weeks where they nearly died from dehydration. There are some accounts of some children whose pets or parents just vanished in the middle of the night, never to be heard of or seen again. In the more extreme cases, some naughty children have had their houses burnt down, losing everything and everyone in it except themselves. My grandmother had heard of this boy named Bobby, who lived a few towns over from her growing up. He was visited by the other Santa one year on Christmas Eve. According to what she had heard from the neighbors, Bobby had woken up in the middle of the night because his dog was whimpering and he had the worst pain in his foot. Getting up to go see what was wrong with Baxter, he fell face down as soon as his feet hit the floor because, well, all of his toes had been cut off. You could tell whoever did it probably used a saw because of the tendrils of skin and shattered pieces of bone that were sticking out of his where his toes used to be. There was blood all over his sheets. Bobby screamed and screamed and his dog's whimpering just kept getting louder and louder. Bobby couldn't take the sound, and, despite his pain, he managed to drag himself across the floor all the way over to the kitchen, to his dog Ross. When he found him, his screams just kept coming. Baxter was kneeling in the corner of the kitchen, where he also saw his father sobbing and holding a baseball bat, crouched beside the body of his mother. Her teeth were scattered all over the floor, and her face was pulpy with blood and bone. She twitched incessantly on the floor, while Bobby's father sobbed, his dog whimpered, and Bobby screamed. But how did you know who was going to be visiting you on Christmas Eve? Santa? or the other Santa, you didn't, Grandma said. If you've been naughty, you better pray and pray and pray that all you receive that year was coal and not a horrible sickness or a dead family or missing body parts. Although I don't remember the story exactly as Grandma told it, there is one thing I remember that she said once the story was done which was a bizarre thing for her to say since we were all so young. I also remembered she had made sure story time this year was told in a room where the rest of the adults couldn't hear her tale. Why do you think Santa and Satan sound almost exactly the same?